Hi everyone, we're gonna get started in just a second here, so if everybody wants to make their way to wherever they're sitting. And I think mostly everybody is. Um, so my name's Mary, welcome to the Data and the Greater Good Meetup. Um, we're really excited to be here. Um, first of all, a big thank you to Workbench who have provided this space for us. Um, Blake from Workbench is gonna come and say a few words. Hi guys, um, welcome to Workbench. But just by a show of hands, how many of you guys have actually been here before? Okay, good amount of you. Um, well, welcome back. For those of you who haven't been here, uh, my name is Blake. I lead operations here at Workbench. Um, just high level overview of who we are and what we do. Um, Workbench is a venture capital fund that specializes in enterprise tech. And what that means at a little bit of a lower level is we're looking to bridge the gap between suits meaning Wall Street and hoodies being the tech industry. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about that, feel free to reach out to me. Again, my name is Blake, and thank you all for coming into our space. Thank you, Blake, Blake and thank you, Workbench, again. Um, also, thank you, Development Guild, for the food. And just so you know, Development Guild is hiring full stack developers and a director of engineering. So if you're interested in that, you can talk to Matthew Weber, who's in the back in the plaid shirt over here. And um, they are also, there's a link to the jobs on the door prizes. And we're going to do that first, actually, before the speaks, speaker. So if you want to pull out the little papers you were given at the beginning and look at your number. the for, We have two great prizes, so two chances. And I don't even think I'm going to be able to pick this one up. The first one is a book from Cooper Hewitt. It is 210 thousand of their objects in their collection and in addition to being very very heavy it is glow in the dark um so i can't even hold it with one hand i'm just gonna do a random generator very fun where is it gonna land so number five there we go oh five right over here So there's yours, and then well, it is heavy. I wasn't lying. <laughs> um, and then we'll do another one, and the other book is the guide to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So another spin. Twenty-five. Where's twenty-five? Oh, great, Chris Christiana. There you go. Thanks. Okay, and then um, we'll get to the main event. So we have two speakers from the Met and the Cooper Hewitt, and we'll get started first with Elena. Thank you. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. Um, so my name is Elena. Um, I've been working in museums for the past 10 years, mainly in digital. Um, I've been doing a lot of research, uh, user research and evaluation of different digital initiatives that includes um, websites, apps, social media, interactives, audio guide, and any other like digital like touch point uh, in, in the museum. Um, I started uh, last fall uh, to work as a full-time professor at Pratt Institute. And today um, I'm going to talk about um, how to implement an analytics culture uh, in an organization based on my experience um, working in museums, especially at Tate and at the Met. Um, so museums get a lot of data from their visitors. Um, they get a lot of data when uh, they book their ticket online, when they um, come to the store, they go to the restaurant, uh, they um, uh, connect to the Wi-Fi, or uh, they download um, our apps. There's also a lot of data coming from digital, from museums visit visiting websites, uh, using our social media platforms, or um, uh, interacting with, uh, with other products. So that represents a huge opportunity for museums um, to use that data. 
it can be used in many different ways. Um, it can be used to improve the user experience, optimize processes. Uh, you can experiment and see what works better. Um, you can um, understand better your audiences, uh, create segmentations, and then based on that, personalize um, experiences. Um, you can see what are your marketing campaigns that work better and uh, optimize those campaigns. And you know, museums get uh, funding from public and private uh, sources, so data can be used to justify that funding and show the impact and value um, of their activities. But in order to use that data uh, strategically and in an efficient way, there is something internally that needs to happen in an organization. You have to do a mindset change. You have to uh, implement, basically, uh, a data um, insights-driven culture in an organization. And these are basically, this is my basically my road uh, uh, map in, in doing that work. Um, it's a step-by-step -step process and it never ends. It's an ongoing process that, you know, I go through uh, the different steps, I go back, and basically those steps are first to do an audit of your data sources, see what you have, what you don't have, um, seeing what is the quality of your data. Maybe you are collecting data, and I've been there, uh, that is not good, that is not accurate. Uh, that needs to be cleaned up. Um, then you have to gather your requirements from the people working in the organization. And I would say that engaging with the people working in that organization is key to, um, to really implement that analytics culture. Um, so basically asking to the whole organization, like, what are their user research needs? What are their evaluation plans? What is the data that they need to make decisions? Um, then based on that, uh, create a data strategy where you have your objectives about how you're going to use the data, what are going to be the processes, um, who, um, who's going to be working uh, on, on the data, are you going to have a team, uh, what is the governance um, um, uh, of that data. And then, um, then based on your strategic objectives of the organization, um, you're going to decide on your metrics and your KPIs, your indicators to see how successful you are in your digital activities. The next step would be about um, selecting the tools to gather the data for those metrics and, and the indicators. And finally, once you um, have your data and you analyze it, I would say that um, the key part of my job is to communicate the findings and those insights. Probably I spend like half of my time creating dashboards, um, creating infographics, and I try to be, um, um, I mean, try to put it in many, in many, many different places, from the intranet to the, an email, and even like next to the microwave in our kitchen, so um, people have something to look at while they are heat up their meal. So, yeah, as I said, this is not like a straight, like, planned. You basically do an audit, maybe one platform, you get some tools, you go back to requirements, you create some dashboards, then you re 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 refine them, then you have new strategy, then you have to select new indicators. So it's an ongoing process that uh, builds up um, slowly. Uh, but at the end, it makes a huge impact um, on, on how you work and how you make decisions. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, some examples of um, data that I've, I've gathered. But kind of the key thing is um, sometimes uh, we are starting the tools because we get a lot of data from Facebook Insights, from Google Analytics. But first, maybe that's not the data that you need, even if there's a lot of like free data there. Um, you have to decide on your tools and your metrics based on your strategic objectives. So that's the first question you need uh, to respond. And then you decide the metrics. And once you have the metrics, you, uh, you set up some targets. So when we'll, you launch an activity, you know how well or bad you are doing. Sometimes that is hard to set up. You can do some benchmarking. You can look at um, your previous year. Um, but it's important, because it happens to me a lot that we launch something, we get some data from Google Analytics, and we are like, OK, is this good? Is this bad? We don't know. Um, so then, uh, next step would be about reporting and communication. How often we need that data, uh, and what actions we are taking in order to influence those results, and of course the tools that we need. So um, I would say that this is a very like basic evaluation framework uh, that I used a lot. I mean, in different formats, 
but basically um, it's uh, like a template where you can um, think about your objectives, where are the metrics for each of those objectives, then your target, what are the methods and tools, and then what are their activities. Because when you start filling in this information, you may find some gaps. Maybe your strategic is not well defined, or um, maybe you don't have that target, or maybe you need a new tool in your system or a new setting, or uh, maybe you want to do something, but you realize, okay, I'm not doing enough work on this area to really make a change uh, in the metric. Um, another key thing in implementing analytics culture, and especially I would say in digital, because that's the area I've been working a lot, um, is to make sure that analytics is embedded in the whole production process. So um, it's not something that comes at the end. Uh, it comes actually when you have that idea of that app, that website, that social media activity that you want to run. Uh, it has happened to me a lot that we launched something and then next day it's like, okay, so how is the analytics doing? It's like, uh, actually, did you add it? the code to the platform because I don't see any data, or maybe there's data that you need after, I don't know, a few months, and you have to do some uh, custom settings uh, to get that data. So basically, I would say, when you plan that activity, make sure that you have an evaluation plan. Then when you are in the phase of production, make sure that you set up your, um, your tools um, correctly so you get the data that you need. And then once the product is live, then uh, you, you create all those uh, reports and dashboards and, and communication tools. And probably I should add another arrow back to the beginning because especially if you work in Agile or, I mean, it's a reiteration process. It's, it doesn't, it never ends, basically. So um, now to the tools. Um, so once you have the metrics, then you will look at which tools you will use to both gather and then analyze the data. So depending on what you want to collect, you may choose a different method. Um, I've been using a lot of like um, tools, digital analytics tools that gather quantitative data uh, based on the user's actual behavior. So uh, things like Google Analytics or Facebook Insights, YouTube Analytics or um, uh, Flurry for apps. Um, but sometimes analytics doesn't tell you the whole story, so you need to bring other tools to the table that give you more qualitative data. So I've been doing a lot of user testing, interviews, focus groups with users, um, and also surveys. And you can also use eye tracking to see where people look in the screen, or um, uh, A-B testing to see uh, which version will work better for users. Um, so now I'm going to talk about a few examples focusing uh, on social media. Um, I would say that probably um, I look a lot at three key metrics. One is um, about based on ob the objective of reaching audiences, like looking at how many people are in your community and how many people you reach with every like post or piece of content, and then how many people engage interact with your content. And basically, the size of each of the circles here will depend um, on the virality of the content or how much is done on your platform or um, on the user's platform. So um, here's an example of um, something that um, I did recently was to look at, OK, um, for Facebook that gives you so much data, let's look at some trends. Uh, so what is the best time to post? Um, looking at the day of the week, you can clearly see, and these are bad news for the social media team, because weekends actually uh, work better and you get higher reach uh, during uh, that time. Something very important, for example, for Facebook, they change the algorithm very often. So looking at how each type of content performs um, is key. So I mean, I've seen in all those years of Facebook how this like graph has been changing. So first they prioritize images, then because everyone was putting text even in on images, they stopped that. And now it definitely is video content. Um, in, that's something that gets higher reach uh, and interactions. And here's a more uh, concrete example uh, of a piece of content. Uh, the Met has been running 360 degree videos uh, on Facebook uh, since they implemented, implemented this new feature. I won't play the video here because actually it works much better uh, on mobile. So you can go to the Met's Facebook page uh, and there is a playlist with all the videos also on the website. 
Um, but basically, you take your phone and you navigate through the Temple of Dendur or some other iconic spaces uh, from the Met. So they were extremely popular on Facebook. We, it was like kind of a like, uh, record in terms of bridge and also video views. On Facebook, we actually don't look at total video views because of the autoplays. Uh, we look at views of, um, of um, videos that have been played at least like 10 seconds or 30 seconds. But something we were very interested in for these videos was in the interaction and in and the comments. So we did some content analysis of the comments and we could see people that live in New York and um, didn't even know about the space or some people that have been there and remember their visit because, you know, um, it was a very impressive space when they came. Um, and also something that happened with this first video about the Temple of Dendor was that uh, people were tagging other friends and saying, oh, look at this new technology on Facebook, how cool it is. So we, ho we got a lot of like techy uh, comments of people about 360 degree videos. You can go very granular on Facebook insights. Um, I, this video started actually with the logo of the Met and then a screen with the title uh, and that, that actually takes 30, uh, no, uh, 10 seconds. So we look at retention time for this video and we saw, I mean, that's very typical on Facebook, but the drop was very big at the beginning, as you can see uh, on the right hand side uh, chart. So for the next one, we decided to demo the title, the credits and all that like introduction, um, like um, clips and um, we actually increase our, our retention time uh, a lot, I think from 14 to 91% uh, of our users. And another thing that informed our decisions about how we create content uh, was looking at how many people play um, videos without sound. Um, when we, when these videos, uh, the 360 degree videos, they have a specific music that was curated by the content team. Um, and we realized that only like 75 percent of those were like listening uh, to the music so um, i mean this is a stat in general about facebook 85 percent of the videos are played uh, without sound and uh, that informs us about um, how we have to make sure that if we have an interview with a curator or if we have any other type of video we make sure that there is like captions and subtitles um, here's another example of social media. This is probably one of my favorite uh, projects that I always like presented. Um, this is from Tate. Uh, we had an, ac um, an activity called the 1840s gift party. Um, we asked users on Tumblr to create um, gifts ab about some specific um, objects from the collection. It's called a, par a party because we actually um, had those gifts um, like in, in uh, projected in these old TV screens in front of the actual artworks. So we invited people to that in uh, later Tate, and um, and that was uh, pretty pretty well received. Uh, we actually got around 600 gifts that were submitted. So I highly recommend you to go to that URL to check other very nice gifts. And um, it was attended by 2,000 people and that came specifically for that event, including, of course, people that submitted their gifts. So we look at uh, analytics. We saw the increase in traffic to these objects. We look at, as well, how much time people spent on those objects. And something that was very interesting was to use social network analysis to see how um, those gifts have traveled uh, on Tumblr. Um, actually, you can see the one on the left hand side here. Uh, now it has over a hundred thousand shares on Tumblr. Um, so it's interesting to see in, in these examples how you have here um, the Tate's network and how like some people that share it actually amplified um, the reach um, of, of this piece of content. And here's another example. Um, this time, um, what I'm looking at is not the Mets activity on Pinterest, but uh, I'm looking at users' activity on Pinterest and trying to see what we can understand from what they are sharing from the collection uh, on this platform. 
So um, we get around 600,000 views uh, to the collection every month. The majority come from Google, people searching for artist names or themes or art movements. But when we look at referrals, Pinterest is always at the top of the list. It, uh, it brings 4% of the total traffic to the website, to the collection. And it's interesting because we have these um, social media sharing buttons on the artwork page and Pinterest is the most used. And that doesn't include, I mean, the data there doesn't include people from Pinterest that have, you know, those extensions on, on the browser. So we were very interested in understanding um, that particular traffic because their behavior is very different to um, uh, other sources such as Wikipedia or, uh, or Google. <coughs> So um, looking at Google Analytics, we can see that that traffic mainly comes from mobile devices and they spend less time on the website than other users. And I will come back to that metric later on. So um, we did a survey and we actually have a segmentation for our website visitors. And basically Pinterest users are users that look for inspiration. Um, we have two segments in that inspiration group, those that are called inspiration seekers and casual browsers. And basically the main difference is that the inspiration seekers, they come on, um, with a focus to the website, to the Mets website, they come actually often to find that content because they know us. Um, and then we have the causal browsers. And those are people that stumble upon some content on social media, they click on a link, and then uh, they get to the Mets website. And it's very different, this information, compared to the whole website. We have more art cre um, artists, creative, creative art professionals, and a lot of uh, personal researchers. And as you can see in the quotes here, there are people like looking for inspiration for many different reasons. So uh, I did an analysis of what people actually were sharing from the collection uh, to Pinterest. And what was interesting that 2017, uh, 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 16,000 objects were shared uh, from the collection. And there is actually a pretty equal distribution in the number of shares. Normally I work with charts that, you know, you have Picasso and Monet and Egypt at the top, and then you have the other objects. So Pinterest actually was um, pretty equal in terms of um, most of the ob objects were shared like once or twice on Pinterest. Um, but what I did was to group them based on different categories, looking at department and art form. And as you can see, there's a clear topic on what people share on Pinterest, and that's related um, to fashion, which is a very popular topic uh, on Pinterest. Um, but what is interesting is that that traffic sort brings uh, traffic to the collection to objects that are not uh, super popular. So I, I'll show you some examples um, that I think are curious. So we have this crochet object. It gets like a thousand views every month. And um, the department, when they saw this, that stat, were like, why is this object getting so many views? So we found it was Pinterest and actually many, many boards about uh, crochet, crafts, and knitting, um, and yarn. So it was pretty interesting about how we are reaching those audiences. This is a, f um, I mean, even within fashion, you find um, those dresses and um, in, in many different boards. So this one is in a teenage, uh, teenage uh, novel. Um, we have a lot of keys on Pinterest as well. Um, and this is a funny one. Um, there is a story called The Bluebird. And apparently, like, keys are um, a, a, an important component of the story. So that's what those are there. And keys are, of course, in boards about keys, but also about tattoos that inspires people to, um, to create tattoos. So um, basically, uh, what this is um, impacting our um, uh, strategy is that we see that these people, we can reach new audiences, but when they come to the website, they don't find the same type of experience. They are there for a very limited time. Um, so we are thinking about how we can create a more engaging, um, um, add more like browsing features that allow people to discover art in the same way as they do it on, on Pinterest. Um, and in general, just to conclude uh, my talk, um, all this data, uh, doing segmentation, looking at analytics on um, going basis, we have um, um, a dashboard in the department, we have an analytics meeting every month. 
but it really helps us to inform a digital roadmap, uh, to be more user-centered. So um, we look at the data and we also do exercises like, um, for example, I write user stories to, to think about the user and how what we are doing will impact uh, their experience and how after launching that feature, we're gonna evaluate uh, the impact. So thank you so much and I'm happy to respond to any questions. Thank you, Elena. We can do um, a short question and answer. Um, does anybody have questions? I'll start you can just wait for the here. mic. Can, can you talk about any like really big surprises that you found from analyzing uh, the data? In general, or? Um, Yeah, I mean, many times, uh, let me think. Uh, I mean, sometimes our uh, hypothesis, and especially when we do A-B testing, uh, completely tell us we are wrong. Um, so, yeah, we're actually testing something on the collection about, um, actually related to Pinterest and how to expand their experience about where to put the content and, you know, have this type of Amazon. Uh, if you see this, you may like that. So we changed the placement to the top and actually that didn't work at all. Um, doing user testing, I mean, probably uh, one that is uh, common in many museums is that museums will have collections, but users don't uh, don't really like look for that when they come to our website. So doing user testing both at Tate and at the Met, um, we had in the navigation um, bar the collection tab, and when we ask user, okay, search for the artworks by Monet. They didn't go to collection. They thought it was something else, an archive. Or, um, and so we actually, uh, when we relaunched both websites, uh, at Tate and at the Met, we changed the name to Art and Artist um, at, the, at Tate and to the art, just Art and at the Met. And that works better. So that was a surprise, especially internally, because we always talk about the collection. <laughs> uh, I think one question here and then. There. So I have a question about how you choose to prioritize certain research projects. So with the ecosystem as large as the Met, both online and in-person, multi-channel, mm -hmm. how do you choose which research projects to take on first? Okay, so I mainly work for uh, the digital department, uh, although I collaborate with um, other teams that work with data. Um, in the digital team, it depends on the digital priorities. Um, and I would say that um, I have kind of some work that, okay, requests that are like, okay, I do that in the day, and then I have like long-term projects. So if I have to do like a survey or um, uh, user testing that takes uh, longer, um, that requires some prioritization in my time and the resources that we have. But it goes back to um, what we want to achieve and we have quarterly goals meetings and we decide on what we want to accomplish that quarter. So based on that, uh, I kind of like do my uh, user research plan. Yeah, there was a question I think there and then go. Sorry, uh, think. Just a quick question. What did you use for the network graph or the visualization there? Um, yeah, it's a tool called Gephi, it's open source, um, and actually you can do like even like the, the chart in real time, so uh, you can put the hashtag from, uh, from Twitter or a, a specific user or keyword, and as people like start tweeting, you can see the network being created, it's pretty nice, I highly recommend it. And you don't need like coding skills or anything, just a little bit of creating an app on Twitter. Hi, um, the question about the possibility of future with analytics. Um, so do you see the insight you generate from analytics will be play a very important role in curation? Like um, you talk about some of the augmenting experience you're trying to gain uh, from the online web browser about user, then you generate maybe a much easier readable content in the in the curation process. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and the other follow up is, um, we, we people talk about deep learning, like um, AI in other industry. Do you see that we play a much bigger analytical inside rule uh, in the curation process in museum? Um, so I hope I understood correctly. So you're asking about artificial intelligence, kind of machine learning, and yeah, we've tried some of that. 
um, especially with the collection and try to uh, create more like browsable and interactive experiences for users. Um, but when we've tried some of the machine learning with our collection, it's not very accurate. So um, w we are like balancing uh, with a tagging project that we are doing the pros and cons of doing manually versus you know like doing machine learning and then having to do a lot of QA. But that's something museums in general are considering. Hello. How do you deal with the spikes in traffic that might be created from events like the Heavenly Bodies exhibit? <laughs> the Met Gala? <laughs> yes, that creates a spike on my Instagram analytics yeah. and on uh, my web analytics. Um, but we have other spikes too, based on some content on Reddit, or I mean, you, you will be surprised. Or when we launch um, our open access initiative, uh, when we release our uh, images to the public domain, that created one of the highest uh, peaks. So um, sometimes I have to do a lot of um, n like clean up in the data and trying to normalize it so I can compare it. Actually, the traffic, for example, to the website, uh, I can't divide it. Uh, I mean, part of it, like visit sections, the exhibitions, the events are related to our program and the visitor trends. And then we have, you know, the collection and all the learning resources and research resources. Those depend on the academic year. So um, I, I try to identify the trends and then um, look at the, yeah, the spikes to see how I, um, data compares year after year. Hi, um. Does the Met ever publish their most shared uh, uh, collection items on, on any of the social networks like uh, Pinterest or Instagram? Um, I mean, we haven't done like, okay, this is the most viewed object of the month or anything. Um, but I mean, we've published some of the research, for example, the Pinterest data here uh, is published on the blog and we publish a lot of other user research that we do. Um, we also have, um, a work of the day, our work of the day, um, and that brings a lot of traffic, and we try to put um, a lot of objects from the collection there. So it's on the blog? Right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. We can take maybe one more right here. Hi, I just had a question about how you define impact and what KPIs you use to, it can be a vague term sometimes, so what KPIs yes. you use. Yeah. Impact, value, and engagement are probably the three words that <laughs> generate a lot of conversation in museums about how you define those. And I would say it depends on the department you talk to. Um, if I talk to the marketing department, for them, like marketing, uh, I mean, impact means, you know, people talking about the museum, people sharing about the exhibitions uh, that they visit, they talk about generating revenue from the marketing promotions. But if I talk to the learning department, I mean, when they talk about impact, is you know something that has learned something during the visit or created maybe an emotional experience for them. So um, it's very hard, and I, I mean, I will go into more details. I mean, there's like the, uh, for museums like social impact, economic impact, and cultural impact. So depending on the type of impact that you're looking at, you may select different metrics. Um, well, uh, um, uh, it's just asking me if that extends uh, over a time period. Yeah. Like yeah. Like no, I think I would say museum is more like one of projects. I mean, we don't look at, uh, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Thank Elena. you, everyone. And next, we're bringing up Carolyn, who is from Cooper Hewitt. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Carolyn Royston. I'm Chief Experience Officer at the Cooper Hewitt Museum, uh, which is part of the Smithsonian uh, on the Upper East Side. Um, I, um, I'm just going to talk today a little bit about, uh, about me, uh, just to tell you who I am, um, but also about how we're using data in museums. Um, some of it is uh, actually covered by Elena, so I, I, I'll go quickly over over things you've already you've already heard um, but really looking at, at what data touch points mean in museums 
thinking about how we use quantitative and qualitative data to help us to develop museum strategies. Um, I'm going to use a case study from uh, my previous museum, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston, um, uh, to really show a sort of deep dive into how we used qualitative data to uh, determine our uh, strategy going forward, our visitor experience strategy. And finally, just a little bit about the platform that uh, we're creating for design at the Cooper Hewitt. Um, so um, just a little bit about me. Um, I um, have been working in museums uh, almost 20 years, um, so a long time. <laughs> seen a lot of change when I started. Um, I worked on a, a, a very major online learning project at the v &A in London. Um, and it was really very early days for, for e-learning. I had a background in, as a teacher. Um, so I've seen a lot of change over the last 20 years in terms of the way that uh, digital has uh, progressed in museums. Um, uh, after the v and I was uh, head of digital at the Imperial War Museum in London uh, for about five and a half years. Um, so I know Elena very well from, from our days in, in London. She was at the Tate. Um, and, you know, an amazing, amazing collection um, at the Imperial War Museum, um, very different to the V&A. Um, and then uh, recently, uh, about three years ago now, I moved to Boston and um, was the first head of digital, director of digital at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. And again, a very different kind of um, museum, a very different kind of collection. And now I'm at the Cooper Hewitt um, and have been there just, it's just five months. So still very early days, <coughs> excuse me, in terms, of, um, in terms of my role there. And I'm going to talk, as I said, a little bit about that uh, towards the end of my talk. So museums and digital, um, you know, as Lena said, digital is now core to to the mission of museums. Um, it's uh, a more holistic approach. You know, it used to be that you were in a digital department, kind of, you know, it was a cot almost a cottage industry and, and it's become more and more important. Um, and now really we're trying to think much more about a holistic approach with the building, the human and the digital working together. Um, where we work in a cross-functional and cross-departmental -department, way, so digital permeates across everything that we do in the museum. And we're starting to see new roles that are emerging that bring on-site and virtual to together. And along with that, there are some new skills um, So, how, in, for improving the visitor experience, which one includes data literacy, and you know, Elena is a, is a, a, a real leader in that area in the museums but also digital literacy. The digital li literacy is still very low in museums. Um, so helping to build confidence in digital skills, working in more agile ways, as you can imagine, you know, when you're putting on an exhibition, you're planning for years ahead. Um, and we come along in the digital realm and we want to do things quickly. So there's a real cultural sort of tension between the different ways that we work. And also evaluation, prototyping, iterating and evaluating. So these are all new areas for museums and you know it may sound surprising to the outside world, but you know, we're we're slowly, we're slowly moving into the 21st century. Um, what's happened? Um, sorry. There we go. So this is a little bit about what, what Dana talked, uh, Elena talked about, which is really the, the, the sort of museum ecosystem and um, you know, the various touch points as a museum that we, that we find ourselves working in. And in the center there, you've got the sort of physical space, which is made up of, you know, a whole, a whole raft of different kinds of digital experiences. And then moving out of the physical arena, you have all of these other touch points, again, that Elena talked about, and new and emerging ones. And so as a museum, you know, it raises really interesting questions for us. It's, it's a very complex landscape that we're in between the, the, the physical and the virtual. We have many different owners and stakeholders across the museum. So in all of those realms, there's almost some department that feels that they have some ownership over these areas. And they're fast moving versus more traditional activities that the museums do. So we have these new challenges, these new, um, what I would say, organizational challenges, which aren't digital at all, but impact on the experience. So you know, again, who owns these channels? Where do they sit and how do they fit together? 
And where does the museum put its effort? You know, all of these, we can't be on all of these platforms. So again, using data to help us to think about, you know, where do we put our effort? Where do we put our resourcing? And what skills do we need to manage these channels as, as, we, as we move forward? And how do we integrate these channels into our more traditional museum practice of, you know, and does it replace some of the things that we've always done as, as museums? So we have a lot of questions that we're trying to grapple with and try to understand. And many of them are not digital questions at all. They're really organizational challenges. So data helps us in some ways to help to answer some of those questions. As, as Elena said, again, it, you know, it helps us to understand more about who our visitors are. It helps us to understand how our visitors interact and engage with us, both in the virtual and physical space. It informs our exhibitions and our programming and where to put our effort. It helps us make better decisions about how to allocate funding and resources. It helps us to identify op opportunities and impacts and gaps. And most importantly, sometimes it helps us to stop doing things. Not very often, we're really bad at it. Um, and <laughs> but maybe we'll get better. And then we think about the visitor journey and about where data and those touch points hit. So we have a pre-visit, you know, how do people engage with us before they come to the museum from that idea of, oh, I'm going to go and visit the Cooper Hewitt today to actually when they visit and then the post-visit. And also, of course, people who don't visit at all and a visit counts as a virtual visit. So we have to also think about all of those different touch points. And around that, we want to think about, you know, creating a single view of that visitor. How are they engaging with us? What are they doing? We want to think about um, what services do we need to design to ensure that these people have a great visit, whether it's on our website, on our social channels, you know, in other places, or in, a, in our physical spaces. And how do we build a ladder of engagement? So how do we, how do we uh, engage a visitor and then, and then encourage them to continu continue the relationship with us? And how do we connect data across the organization? So as I said, all of those are going back to that ecosystem, all of those buckets, they're all collecting data. So how do we connect them into something that's meaningful and that we can gain insight from? And what is our success criteria? So that, those are really the questions that we want to ask as we think about data, as we think about its, its impact for us, um, and as we think about it across the entire visitor journey. And then we've also got the quantitative versus qualitative, which is very hard to say. Um, <laughs> so when we think about the quantitative data, we're really talking about larger samples of people that we're, that we're trying to um, get data from. It tends to be more objective in general, often seen in an exit or an online survey or through observations. And it gives us a broad picture of visitor satisfaction. Um, and does other things too, but those those are the kind of top 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 headlines. And qualitative is really about really a very small sample of people, and gaining more personal um, a more personal view, understanding more about behaviour and motivations. And we often do that through in depth interviews or shadowing people sort of as they're walking around the museum, obviously with their permission. <coughs> Otherwise, it's just creepy. <laughs> Um, so what I want to do now is, is just take you through, um, quite quickly, um, a, a case study at the Gardner Museum in Boston, um, which was um, really a, a qualitative study that we did um, to really think about um, uh, how we understand as a museum, better understand the visitor experience, and how we then can develop, start to develop services um, f so that we're actually meeting the needs of our visitors. So, how many people have been to the Gardner Museum? Oh, wow, quite a, quite a lot of you. So you know, you know a bit about it and what it's all about. But it was it was founded by Mrs. Gardner, um, and she built the museum at, at the um, at the turn of the 20th century. She was a, a leading art, art art collector, very unconventional, uh, forward-thinking woman, um, and she, um, over really a 10-year period, amassed uh, what is one of the great collections in, in the United States. Um, and often against, you know, um, winning things against um, 
um, other philanthropists, mainly men, who often had much deeper pockets. So she was a wily, a wily and, and smart woman. And she de developed this museum, created this museum um, <coughs> in Boston and opened in 1903. And she lived on the fourth floor of the museum. And she apparently used to yell down at people that were visiting from the fourth floor into this, into this amazing courtyard space. So interesting approach to visitor experience. Uh, <laughs> um, so the museum you know, is very unassuming from the outside, but from the inside, um, it's this amazing, uh, stunning courtyard, which is really the centerpiece of the museum and built in the style of an Italian palazzo. Um, and the courtyard is considered a living collection, um, and it's actually changed nine times over the course of the year. Um, and the museum is filled with um, installations, and um, she actually cur curated these herself, and um, in the will, um, it's stipulated that nothing can change in the museum. So it is essentially how it was um, when, she was when she was alive. Um, there are no labels, there's very low lighting, it's not a linear experience through the galleries. And so it's a very unusual um, visitor experience compared to the way that we experience galleries today and museums today. And it's, you know, it's filled with incredible paintings like this Titian uh, painting, Rape of Europa, probably, arguably, one of the most important paintings in the United States. And she sort of hung it and then surrounded it with, with Baroque textiles and Rococo furniture and didn't sort of explain why. Um, and the idea was that she just wanted people to experience these things and, and, and to have a very personal experience as they went walked through the museum. And you know, people, some people love that, and some people are very uncomfortable with that. Um, and it also, in 2012, a new Renzo piano uh, wing was built, and uh, this expanded the museum and gave it a restaurant and a shop and a temporary exhibition space and a new performance space. Um, so there were temporary exhibitions for historic art, um, contemporary, and then this amazing performance space um, where there is um, a very vibrant concert series and, and also contemporary musicians uh, play as well. And then the other thing that the museum is very famous for, and which you may know, is that, that it had an art heist. Um, and um, in 1990, 13 of the masterpieces were, from the museum were stolen and have yet to be, be recovered. So it's an ongoing case with a $10 million reward. Just putting it out there. <laughs> you know, you came, for, you came for a talk about museums and, you know. Um, but it's, it's um, a really, the museum has left the frames as they were waiting for the paintings to come back because remember, nothing can change in the museum. And it's very, actually very poignant and Many people come to visit, and the first thing they say is, "Where are where, where are the, the the stolen the stolen art frame the art frames with the stolen paintings?" So it's a very complex visitor experience. Many different things going on here: historic building, contemporary building, historic collection, contemporary exhibitions, performing arts, and gardens. And we wanted to, to, to really help people to understand that this isn't a traditional museum. And as we started to think about um, creating uh, a whole suite of digital projects, one of which was a new website, we wanted to think about you know, how do we pull together this amazing museum into something that's coherent for visitors to help them to understand what the Gardner Museum is all about. And so, we realized that we had two fundamental questions, which was how can we set visitors up for a great visit? And what is the role of digital within the wider visitor experience? And digital at the Gardner, when I joined, was you know, pretty much anti-tech. Um, they only allowed photography in 2016. Um, there's no in-gallery interpretation, this old website that you can see here. And I was the first director of digital in 2015. So we thought about digital as a very, some wanted to think about it as something holistic. We wanted it to be visitor focus. We wanted to concentrate on key projects and we wanted to use digital as an opportunity to develop some new ways of working. And I used the website project to kickstart a new approach to thinking about visitor experience. Because I said, I can't design a website or think about how to pull together 
content and a, a navigation for a website if we ourselves don't really understand what the visitor experience is internally. So I used a digital project to kickstart really what was a visitor experience project that was um, a deep dive into thinking about our visitors. And so what we did was we did a visitor, we did a, a visitor journey, journey mapping project. Um, this gave us a way to think about designing a new visitor experience. Um, we wanted to create a coherent and effective visitor experience that will support repeat visitation, but also set first-time visitors up, who are over 70% of our visitors, to have a great experience with the museum. We did a journey mapping project that was cross-departmental, and it involved stakeholder interviews, and you can see we did visitor interviews. So stakeholder interviews was about the internal interviews and asking the staff what was their experience for, what did they think the ex visitor experience was like, which was very interesting, and particularly for staff that had been there for a long time and were very sure about what the visitors were experiencing. They knew exactly what we needed to do versus people who were, you know, like me, who were sort of newer and going, what's it all about? You can see we only interviewed um, eight first-time visitors and seven repeat visitors. And we used a consultant and also the gardener staff. And the idea behind the project was that we would use an expert consultant who would also help us to build capacity within the museum so that we could then adopt this way of working without needing to bring out in outside help. So there was a real, um, you know, going back to that idea of how do you build skills and how do you build understanding and make change happen in a museum, this was one of the ways I thought we could do it. And our aims were you know, to provide a holistic view of the visitor journey, provide a basis for designing new visitor experiences, work together and develop a shared language and, and create a sort of single journey for our visitors, and try to map some different types of visitors against the needs and motivations that they have on a visit to the museum. And after that experience of two days, um, we ended up with this, which was a, a map, a visitor journey map, and it shows um, we decided to focus on first-time visitors um, because, as I said, they make up over almost 70%, and we felt that if we could get it right for them, then we would get it right for everyone. And we divided up the journey into pre-visit, the transition from when you enter, which is in that new building, into um, the transition from the new to the old building, the historic palace, the palace itself and the, the um, experience in there, and then the leaving. And you can see that it's a graph of ups and downs. So the first big down is parking. And you, there is no parking at the museum. But, and you think, well, what's it got to do with us? Tough. But actually, people come in after trying to park for half an hour and 45 minutes, and they're cross. So they're starting their journey off like irritated, even though it's got nothing to do with us. So, um, so this was interesting. The coat check, we live in Boston, we, I did live in Boston, it's very cold in the winter, people have big coats. We don't have a big enough coat check area. So when people, people have to queue. And also we don't allow bags in the palace, so people had to leave their bags and, you know, so it was a whole big thing also a downside. And then they walk into that amazing courtyard and it's a wow moment, so the, the graph goes right up, and so on and so forth. And what we did was we, we, for each of these touch points, we looked at, you know, what, um, what were people, what, what were people's questions around those different touch points? What were the actions? And what were the perceptions? And we mapped that for each of those each of those areas, and that's what's in the bottom bit of the of the of the map. And what was so interesting about this was, you know, those people that that, that had been at the museum for a long time and had these assumptions were suddenly had to listen to real people talking about walking through the museum and their experience. And they were su so surprised, you know, because there were things that we thought were obvious, or they thought were obvious, but actually they weren't at all to other people. Um, and, you know, the, the, the assumptions that, that people had, so one of the things we realized was that all our marketing material kind of had the old, like had masterpieces or 
pictures of the palace, and then when people arrive, they go into a contemporary building, the Renzo Piano building, and they're like, where, where, is this the palace? I don't, where am I? I don't get it, and there's no art here. Um, and some people know the gardener because of the music series and the concert series and maybe visited the museum 20 years ago and thought, well, it never changes. Why would I bother going back? And so not understanding that we now had new spaces or perhaps that we were now starting to provide different kinds of programs and interpretation around, around the, the, the historic collection. So lots and lots of like incredible data different data to the, to the type of data that Elena is collecting, but giving us such a rich context for us to then think about, well, well, what do we want to do about it? So what did we learn from this experience? We learned that first time visitors are confused. As I said, they sort of come into the, into the museum and they're like, you know, I don't get this. They're curious because it's not a normal museum. They're frustrated because there are no labels and there's not a lot of information to help you. They feel a bit overwhelmed because the rooms are just chock full of stuff. Um, and, you know, amazing stuff. Like um, uh, the first Matisse that came into America, she didn't like it, so she hid it behind a door. You know, it's like, or, the, or people walk into the room at that and see that Titian, and they know it's an important painting, but there's nothing to help them to understand what they're looking at. And so, you know, it's, 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 it's an interesting... Um, it's an interesting situation. And then finally, they want, really want to learn more about her and the collection and, of course, the theft. So this is valuable, valuable information. And this insight helped us to see that we need to give our visitors, first-time visitors, more information at the right time and place in their visit and in a form, and in a form that's consumable for them. And that we need to scaffold the visitor experience and support them in making the most of their visit. And this was an amazing springboard for me to then think about what do we need to do when we design our new website and other materials. And internally, we created a visitor experience steering group that was made up of, of kind of key senior people. And then it, we involved all these other departments as well in this process. And we created a set of principles around visitor experience, which I won't go into, but they gave us a kind of benchmark or a sort of way to go back to think about, you know, are we, are we using these principles um, as a guide? And, and, you know, part of that was will we, we will work in an agile way and prototype and iterate and evaluate and be committed to doing that. All new things for the museum. So one of the things that we did was... Um, we created a, um, uh, as we started to make the website, we started to think about, you know, how do we, how do we answer, how do we answer some of these things? And um, so one of the things that we realized that might be helpful was we, we created a, a very short video, which I'll play for you, which showed people what the museum was like. And this, every, every person that goes to the Gardner website the very first time gets this video. They can, they can click out of it if they want, but if they are prepared to sit there for 30 seconds, it actually will help to tell them about the museum. So let's see if I can, if I can play that just quickly for you. One woman's daring vision to immerse you in a world of art that's a world apart. A personal museum to spark your imagination and awaken your senses. Discover connections between masterpieces and beauty of every kind. Explore and enjoy Isabella's legacy, her palace, and a vibrant new wing, music, and dance, contemporary art and artists, and our sumptuous garden courtyard. Be transported by the place she created for the enjoyment of the public forever. So it was just, you know, again, it gave, just gave peop gives people a way of looking and being able to actually see the museum and see that there are two buildings, um, that um, it has a historic and contemporary element to it, that there's music and dance. So all the things that people were confused about, we tried to cover in that, uh, in that video. Oops, we don't need to watch it again. Um, <laughs> 
Um, and then we, then we designed a website. And the website is very, very different to the way it was designed before, which was a website that was kind of divided up into departments. What we wanted to do with this website was really, again, go back to that information that we got from the journey map, which was you know, a lot of information about how you can visit. And then you'll see the two side panels. One is about Meet Isabella and her museum. And that is stories about her, the museum, and all of the kind of question, main questions that visitors had when they, um, when they come to the museum. And on the right, we have enjoy art, music collections, and more. And that really is bringing all of those elements, the art, the music, the gardens, uh, together in one place, just so that people understand that actually this is the garden museum. So it's not a traditional museum, and it's not a traditional collection. So we wanted, again, to try and get that across. The other thing that we did was um, we created a, a new audio guide, um, an immersive tour that was much more around helping people to understand what the experience was like when they get to the museum. So this idea of there are no labels, the lights are really low, the, you know, it's, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, it's OK, right? It's OK to, to feel all of those things, to feel overwhelmed, to feel frustrated just try and enjoy it. So what we did was we created um, almost I, what I call an immersive audio tour that was um, we give every first time visitor now when they come um, and it's an 18 minute tour that basically takes them from the historic build, uh, the contemporary building into, that, into the historic courtyard and in that process of 18 minutes the curator talks to the visitor almost like they're walking with her. So it's not a traditional audio tour. I'll just play you, play you a couple, if I can, and maybe just a, a, few, a few seconds of that. I'm Christina Nielsen, curator of the collection. But before I tell you about this fabulous courtyard, I'll keep quiet for a moment. Just begin to soak it in. Move forward along the edge of it, or even around it, especially if there are other people clustered at the beginning. Take a seat on one of the stone benches if you like. The music you're hearing is from Mozart's The Magic Flute. Isabella had an orchestra playing this on the opening night of her museum. When I have people with me who are visiting for the first time, I tell them to look at the courtyard from bottom to top. I think it shows Isabella's journey through time. The bottom level is like an ancient sculpture garden. In the middle is a Roman mosaic. That mosaic has an electrifying image of a head of Medusa at the very center. She's a mythological creature whose gaze could turn men to stone. Now, let your eyes take in the ancient Greek and Roman sculptures surrounding it. They're all female statues. Isabella was a champion of female causes. She said that women's education was the key to the 20th century. Okay. Um, so you can see it's not a sort of traditional audio tour, and people are walking around. Um, they basically put the, the, the tour in their pocket, and they've got a heads-up experience. And that was, again, you know, trying to think about how we can scaffold. Um, oh, gosh. Again, you can listen to that uh, later. Um, yeah, so we wanted to create this idea. And then, and then the idea behind these tours is that we can then build a library of them. These are kind of immersive walks through the museum using multiple voices, some outside voices, um, as well as, as internal. And that it really can help both with visitor questions and also wayfinding, which is a which was a real problem in the museum, and we also felt that by having multiple, having building a, a library of these tours would also encourage repeat visitation. Because for those people that think, well, the museum hasn't changed for twenty years, forever, not twenty years, forever, why would I come back? Having these tours then, you know, allows a different type of perspective and a different kind of voice. So, um, so that's just some ways that we that we thought about you know, how we use the, the, the data from the journey mapping to really influence and impact 
the way that we changed and thought about the visitor experience. And through all of this, we did evaluation. So we kept going back to visitors, kept asking them, is this, is this what, what, what you want? Is this, are we answering the needs that we, and the objectives that we set out to do? So the value of journey mapping, you know, really is, as I say, a springboard to work in a new way, enables you to design a service across touch points really gives you deep insight into visitor behavior from a, from a very small sample of data, but rich data. Build, can build capacity internally so that we are able to go on and do that work ourselves. Helps answer key challenges that are visitor focused, but really important for the museum to understand that this is just the beginning. Once you do the journey mapping, you actually have to do something with it, otherwise it's completely pointless. Um, and so that kind of diagram I showed you of the various, of the, of the steering group and the departments around it is really about the, the, the change in mindset and change in culture um, to think about this, this way of working. So just very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time, um, I, I, I left um, the gardener and I think they're still carrying on and doing all that work. Um, and I've taken up this new role at, at the Cooper Hewitt, which is Chief Experience Officer. Um, and it's a new role for museums um, and obviously a new role for the Cooper Hewitt. But it's really about bringing different visitor facing functions together and to have someone who's looking across the organization and joining up those silos. Also putting the visitor at the center, being the visitor advocate and really thinking about this integration between the human and the physical and the digital, um, and thinking about, you know, going back to that journey map, you know, what is the right thing to be giving people at the right moment in the journey? And so having somebody that's kind of looking at that across the organization, as opposed to, you know, I own this bit, I own this bit, I own this bit, I hope is going to be the way that museums start to think increasingly um, going forward. So um, just finally, at the Cooper Hewitt, um, we have a mission which is to inspire, educate and empower people through design and a vision for everyone to discover the importance of design and its power to change the world. Um, we've been working on a strategic plan which is going to be launching soon and it's sort of thinking about the next three years at the Cooper Hewitt. And one of our, we have five goals in that plan. One of them is to knit digital into everything that we do, um, which I'm very happy about. Um, and another one which is about being a platform for design. And just very briefly going to talk about that and what that means. So, so being a platform for design, we really want the Cooper Hewitt to, to be thought of um, as more than our physical building. Um, and to not just for our visitors, but also internally for us to be thinking and having a mindset around that. And we want to use the power of the Cooper Hewitt brand to convene conversations and partnerships and resources and experiences um, and our expertise across multiple platforms and channels and to use data to, um, to, to help us to design services and inform act our actions. So, you know, similar to what Elena's been talking about and similar to the to the Gardner experience, it's thinking about how we connect all those different buckets of data into something meaningful that will help to inform what we do as a museum going forward. And as part of that, very important is that we want to embed data literacy into our everyday practice so that it's actually everyone's job, not just, you know, an Elena, um, as great as she is, but um, that everyone is thinking about it and thinking about, you know, where can we collect data? What are the touch points? What kinds of information do we need? And how do we want to use that? And then bringing that together to really help to inform where the museum puts its effort um, and, and ideas going forward. So I think that's, that's it. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you want to have a few questions? Right here. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, the redesigned website for the Garden Museum that you showed, first of all, was beautiful. And um, unlike in, in its look, any other um, museum website that I've seen, 
Um, so my question is, um, did you encounter any challenges, um, particularly from maybe high-level museum stakeholders, in proposing that design? And if so, how did you overcome them? And was the data, how was the data helpful in overcoming that? So that's why I wanted to do that journey mapping work first, because that just that was that was we just kept went, kept going back to that um, over again, and it really helped us to, as I said, to determine who our core audience was going to be for that website. Um, I wanted the website to be really beautiful because the museum is beautiful. And I didn't have a lot of opposition to that. We worked with Fabrique, who are a Dutch company, um, and they designed the Reich Museum website and the Van Gogh Museum website and the Design Museum in London. So um, I, uh, you know, they had a, a real, um, have a real design aesthetic and really understood the, um, essence of the museum very very quickly, and we had some um, we had some resistance around really blowing up the navigation. And what we did for that was we did a lot of user testing, um, and and we had a very clear kind of decision tree matrix <laughs> um, when we were when we when we were looking at kind of key milestones in the website. So. Um, and part of part of that was um, making sure that we, you know, that we involved visitors in the um, in, in in the development of the design. Um, so it was. We, there were moments when it was trying. Um, let's put it that way. But it was for the most part actually. It was it was um, it was a good experience. And we we got rid of so much content that that was just you know. Had been there forever and 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 really really streamlined the whole thing. So. Mm. Um, so what kind of I guess insights or challenges have you collected so far at your time at Cooper Hewitt? Um, good question. Um, it's I mean very different. The museum is in such a different place because you know for those of you who visited, it's very tech heavy. Um, so there's a lot of data that they're collecting, have been collecting through the pen um, and the digital tables, um, and through um, other other touch points as well. Um, and I think that um, we 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 have. We have a lot of information from the pen about user experience and the visitor experience in terms of how the pen has changed behaviours. Um, again, it's a very heads-up experience um, and it's um, a very immersive experience and it's a very social experience. And so, we really want to, um, you know, th think about that with whatever we go forward with. You know, how do we, how do we keep those those elements? Um, which people seem to really enjoy, um, and um, and we have also, you know, some similar challenges. It's a it's a it's a mansion that wasn't built to be a museum, and so there are visitor experience issues, which are, you know, wayfinding is 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 not always easy. Um, you know, the, the the trying to do design exhibitions in a mansion is not always easy, and um, and people have com have lots of questions about. Um, Andrew Carnegie and about why is this a museum and so similar things to the gardener as well um, but I haven't gone deep enough yet into sort of looking at the visitor experience in terms of um, you know fully understanding yet what's going on and also what what we might want to, to what changes we might want to make some ideas but nothing concrete yet okay Sure. Hi. Um, I have a question about working with curators and what strategies you might use to sort of bring them into the digital age if they're resistant. Um, you know, for, for a lot of us, we see the value so much and, and some of them are a bit more tense yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, I think it's, it, it really depends. I mean, I've, I've been quite lucky, I suppose, in my, in my career in museums where, you know, the Imperial War Museum, I mean, it's, a, you know, was, was, was a, a very old-fashioned museum in many ways, but had a contemporary collection because it was founded in 1919. So the material that we're working with was, you know, was really very, you know, rich media basically. And so um, the curators were quite, you know, were quite keen, I think, to 
to showcase, you know, use digital to help them to showcase the collection. And I was incredibly lucky at the Gardener because, you know, the the the, the curator that you heard on the on the talk um, was um, really saw the value of digital in, in helping to bring that museum to life in a different way, in a way that hadn't happened before. And at the Cooper Hewitt, you know, they've been they have so much digital kind of embedded into the museum now that it's sort of in their workflow. So I've, I've been quite fortunate, but I know, you know, it can be difficult. And I think my, my strategy is, you know, that you have to pace things um, and you have to understand where people are in their digital kind of understanding and in, in their competency and how confident they feel. And I think also that you have to um, really look at what, what, where, where can you make an impact? Where can you, what can you do with that curator's collection that only can happen in a digital space? Or you know, how can you show, help to showcase their collection in a new way? So it's really about trying to work with them to think about what's important to them and then to think about you know, what you can do with that. And work with, work with curators, start with curators who, who want to do this. Is my, would also be my advice. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, just wondering, uh, looking, going back to that org chart that you showed of the steering committee that mm. you had at the Gardener, to, to what extent, if at all, did you try to involve them in the actual research process as it was doing, as you were doing it, rather than simply like presenting the research to them? And and did you try it? And if it, if you did, did it help? And to what extent did you learn from it? And might that you might be able to use at Cooper here? And you can only do this by involving them. Um, because you, they have to see the value of this work, and they have to, you know, those two days that we spent together, no one had any time. Everyone was like, I don't understand what this is, you know. And then by by the by the by the morning, the end of the first morning, they were totally into it. And we, you know, this shared language and this shared understanding was critical. And then what we did was we. You know, using an outside voice, so using a consultant, can often be very, very helpful as well, because it's not me, it's it's someone else who's kind of providing that expertise. And what we did was we did that work, and then she came back when we had the journey map, and we did a presentation, the senior management team who had all been involved in the process, to the director. and helped her to see the value of doing it. I mean, ideally, I would have had the director involved as well, but unfortunately, she wasn't available. Um, but it, it then became it, not my project. It was our project as a museum. And that's very, very important, because when it's your project, you know, it's very easy for people to criticize or to say, oh, look, it's failed. Oh, you know, and then it, it, it can't work like that. So a project like this has to be a whole museum project. And I just, I mean, I use the website craftily to, 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 to move the museum in a different way. Um, because it wasn't, a, you know, you can see it's not a digital project. But absolutely vital that they are involved all the way through. Uh, yeah, can you just say a little um, about how you think this digital and data-driven focus um, changes the way that museums think about the visitor and kind of in particular who that visitor might be. Excuse me. Um, can you say the first bit again? Sorry, I was just having a drink of water. Really, really Sorry, I was listening, I promise. But can you just say that again? Really kind yeah. of how, how the digital and, and data-driven kind of focus changes how a museum views the visitor, right. um, and then kind of in particular who that visitor, they might view that visitor as being. Yeah, I mean, I think it, I mean, I think it, it, it gives you, it gives you insight that you don't, ha you don't have otherwise, otherwise it's just assumptions, um, and, and it enables you to um, have facts, basically, <laughs> or to have something real, so that when people kind of push back against ideas, you can say, "Well, no, actually, you know that that idea for an exhibition, no one got no one got at all what it was about. Um, so let's not do that again in that way." So I I think it's really helping to um, 
to, to move away from this very subjective, this very we know how to do it kind of mentality into something which is more, I call it more intelligent. Um, and, you know, we're definitely, we're, we're definitely still on a learning curve in terms of thinking about, you know, how to change mindsets around that. You know, I think there's still, um, I think there's still a, a, a lot of work we need to do with that. But I think in terms of actually knowing about the visitor, again, I think, you know, if you think about a visitor, um, you know, a visitor could be um, a foreign tourist that's in New York and is kind of doing museums. It could be a person in the local neighborhood who's a member and comes back regularly. Um, it could be, you know, um, it could be, you know, a multitude of different types of people. And each of those people are going to have a different experience and a different kind of engagement with the museum. And you, if you design for all of that, you're not going to produce a good experience. And I think what we're trying to do now by under, trying to understand who these visitors are, who, what their behaviours are, what their motivations are for engaging with us, is so that we can design better services for them that are more customised. I think we'll do one more this afternoon. Okay. okay. Um, I just had a question about service and visitor-oriented design generally and how that compares to museum-specific design. So there's a lot of visitor experience research that goes into amusement mm -hmm. or public transit, hotels and other types mm -hmm. of uh, mm -hmm. in-person physical, mm -hmm. multimodal experiences. Um, I was just wondering if you would mind speaking about some of the similarities across those industries mm. and then maybe what makes museums distinct among those industries. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can speak to, I don't know how well I know other, other, other industries. I think about, other brands that I like and why I like them, and and then I think about, you know, what are the what are the things that I like, and how would I think about that with a museum? Um, but I think for me, it's you know, it is this idea of a, a seamless experience. So um, and understanding as well, you know, some of these other other areas like Amazon, where it's a digital first experience you know, been designed for, for a digital environment, but museums haven't. So we've, we're learning how to integrate and how to give status, if you like, to, the, to, the, to our digital environments as much as our physical spaces. Um, and, and also, you know, this idea of, you know, when people come to the Gardner website, for example, we want them to have a beautiful experience. We want them to see the aesthetic. We want them to be able to kind of see inside the museum through the website. And then when they come to the museum, it's a similar experience. It's not a disconnect. It's not like, oh, I thought it was going to be something else, and, and, and I'm really surprised. So thinking about how we design that throughout every kind of encounter and touch point is part of our challenge and as I said because museums aren't really set up because you know we still have in many ways like a Victorian um, kind of org chart structure um, we're catching up um, it's you know it's people don't come into a museum and think oh that's the admissions department oh that's the membership department oh now I'm engaging with the exhibitions people oh now this is the curators must be doing this bit like people don't think like that you know they see it as a museum and one museum and, and that includes things like the cafe which often we don't you know is a concession or the shop or buying a ticket on our website which is often a third party site but People don't think like that. So we have to get better as museums to think about how we join up all of these various um, touch points so that it does feel like a coherent whole. And it's, it is a challenge. And you know, the, you can imagine what that challenge will, would be like at the Met. Um, you know, it's a little bit easier when you're in a smaller museum um, where you haven't got you know, as many silos. and. Um, and, and you know, you basically know the people that you're working with. Um, but it's, you know, even so, it's very difficult. So I don't know if that answered your, your question. Okay. Thank All right. So okay. Thank you.
Well, thank you all so much for coming. And our next one is going to be July 23rd. We'll have somebody from the Whitney and from Lincoln Center speaking. So that's something to look forward to. And then Kim is going to talk about UX and data meetup next month. Hi, everyone. Uh, so this meetup is a spinoff of the UX and data meetup. And we will have our next event on July 9th. We'll have Dale Kim, who is a founder of a new startup called AI Reverie. And he's going to be talking about using synthetic data to train machine learning. Learning. And that'll be at the creative group space. It's near Grand Central. But if you find our meetup uh, on meetup.com, UX plus data, you can sign up for that now. Thank you.